on the trails, and uh, there's a new trail that's been cut um, off of uh, Cardiac Bypass Trail. So um, if you want to look at a new trail, you can see a new trail that's been cut that makes it a little bit simpler to walk out to the amphitheater. And a lot of, a lot of work that was done today. It's looking really great. Thank you all for all your hard work whether it be at the college or the academy. I wanted to mention something. Um, for those of you who may be struggling with uh, poison oak, anybody here have any poison oak issues? Okay, not so many, good. No, nope. maybe two or three people. Um, there is an opportunity to be involved in another ministry if you're struggling with that. Um, Got a call from Adventist World Radio yesterday morning. Kyle Allen, who's the vice president there. They have an evangelistic series going on right now, and they're kind of overwhelmed with questions. And they need some digital pioneers. They would train you, and they would get you ready to um, answer Bible questions from people that have, um, have questions about the evangelistic content they're listening to. So if anyone is interested in that and would like to be involved, they have a web-based training and they get you all set up um, that you could answer questions and be involved in helping with that. I think that particular series of meetings is over like October 17 or something, so um, not too much longer. But if you are interested in that, please uh, come up and see me and I'll get your contact information and get it to them and get you what they sent me so you could, you could uh, maybe be involved in that. Again, we don't want you to... And there's also other jobs just working on the trail itself next week instead of picking up things that may have poison oak on them. Um, the person helping us, Randy, I think his name's Randy Martin, um, that's been helping us so much in the community, he said another way to address poison oak is right when you get through working to take uh, rubbing alcohol in a spray bottle form and spray it on the section of your body where you think you might have poison oak. He said that works better for him than soap and showers and different things. So he's been at that for a number of years. So it might be something practical for you. And you don't want to have poison oak get started. I've had some family members really struggling with that. And several years ago, we were working out here in another section of the campus, and I had 70 students in my, my class at that time, and my amazing facts, uh, College of Evangelism. And we went out and we cleaned up a bunch of stuff, and I had no idea. I was, I was brand new, and I didn't even warn them about poison oak. And we had 50 of the 70 that got poison oak. That was, I was not too popular at that time, and they really struggled. So, anyway, we understand that that can be that can be a that can be a real challenge. All right. Um, well, in thinking about what we could talk about tonight, I thought about what could be practical, what could be helpful, or what maybe is something that um, people are thinking about. Uh, a lot of people talk to me and they said, man, why, do, why don't you guys talk about relationships? You talk about the Sabbath. I thought about that. You know, the Sabbath is the ultimate relationship with God. If that's going re correct, everything else will go correct. The Ten Commandments are the ultimate diagram of relationships, right? Like I used to des describe it when I was talking to people in Bible studies. I said, you know, commandments are, are the ultimate pattern, you know. If I, if I have my wife... I don't have any other wives before her. I don't have any wives at all. Right? Amen? Amen. And uh, if she came home and saw me sitting there and with an image of her and kissing the image, how many think that would not go over well? <laughs> See, it's the ultimate guide to relationships. Or if every single time I stubbed my toe, I said, Luminitsa. <laughs> you know, every negative thing I was associating with my wife's name, how many think that would probably not be good for the relationship? And if I... If she had a birthday and I always like kind of missed it, like, you know, 
uh, I feel like maybe it might be your birthday today. And she goes, you don't know what it is? It doesn't really matter. How many think that would be kind of a downer to the relationship? Yes? Right? Um, so, and of course, if I killed her, that would not be good. <laughs> Let's say I, you know, if I stole from her every time I go out with her, like, where's my purse? Oh, sorry, I just I couldn't help myself. <laughs> or if I lie, you see what I mean? So the, so the Ten Commandments are the ultimate guide to relationships, right? And if they're the ultimate guide, what's the largest commandment? It's the Sabbath commandment. It's the ultimate way of actually entering in a relationship with God. And if, if he's your God and you're in a relationship with him and you just love him, every other relationship is going to be benefited. How many think that's really true, what I'm saying? So, um, you know, I also was thinking about the Sabbath trail. You know, what about people that go there that don't know about the Sabbath? I don't know what they have under here. I hope it's not, I don't know what it is. But. Are you okay? <laughs> no. um, but really, you know, God desires, his, the biggest thing in the Old Testament is he says, look, I want to write my law in your hearts and minds. I will do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to not only do that, I will live in you, I will walk in you, and I'll give you peace, and I'll give you joy. So the last time I talked to you, I talked a little bit about distractions, right? If we actually have God in our heads, in our hearts, in our minds, we're not going to get as distracted. We're not going to have drama all the time. How many of you are kind of sick of drama? And that's why people are talking about relationships, because they're having some kind of drama with relationships. That's why they talk about that. Do you think I don't know this? I'm like a white blood cell. Look at my hair. I'm not, like a, I'm not a red blood cell. I haven't been around 120 days. I'm not like, you know, I'm not like a, you know, a stomach cell, 72 hours. I'm a white blood cell. So I've, I've, I've heard these things before, right? So I thought I'd talk about this. You know, and that is... And usually I talk about this in marriage and family class. I have a whole actual class called Marriage and Family. How many of you have ever taken that class? Okay. <laughs> they look kind of shell-shocked out there. <laughs> but do we talk about relationship in that class? We talk about all the chemicals that are, are, are you know, released if you do this and if you do that. If you're looking at someone in the eyes directly, I'm not looking at anyone right now. I'm just kind of glazed. And you're looking at in the eyes directly, man, that triggers. That, <laughs> there is a cascade of hormones that are released with that. That's why when people are looking at each other, they kind of look away. You know you're to the cafeteria and you look at some. That's because you intrinsically know that you, did someone just bark at me? <laughs> Uh, that's because you intrinsically know this. Is there a dog in here? Oh, okay. Maybe someone has Tourette's or something. Okay. Um, it can happen. It can happen. So, but you know what? We're built. We're built for relationship physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Yes or no? We're built for that. And, you know, so it doesn't just happen that everything just waits until Pastor Don has the marriage and family class. <laughs> How many of you have noticed it? So, you know, there's all of these thoughts maybe that go through our minds and uh, thoughts of love. Look at the person next to you if it's appropriate and say, love. Some, some of you, it's just not appropriate, right? You're just even nervous thinking about it. You're like, no, 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 I'm not saying that. <laughs> I had no idea you'd have that much of a reaction to that. But, you know, we have this sense of, you know, I want to have a relationship that's close, that's meaningful to me, and I want to have it before Jesus comes. I hear all these sermons about Jesus might come, the time of trouble, what the Pope is doing, and I, I don't care about the Pope. I want to have a boyfriend. Who cares about the Pope? I want to have a 
girlfriend. All right, some of you are really tracking here tonight. I don't know. Or I want to get married. And you long for the day when your lives will be intertwined with someone else on every level. And this agony is not helped by the fact that we live in a culture that seems to try and make that the biggest thing. The biggest thing ever. Have a relationship with someone of the opposite gender or even, a, unfortunately, not even that classification holds true anymore. And, and, and we're kind of surrounded with the idea that every appetite we have should be satisfied just instantly. I'm hungry, I got to eat. I'm thirsty, I got to drink. I'm a boy, I got to have a girl. I'm a girl, I got to have a boy. And it's easy in this situation to kind of lose your focus. Lose your focus. Now, let me, let me just say, we at Weimar, we believe in dating, courtship, marriage. Right, Vito? I don't know why you're sitting so far from your wife, but you have your children in between you. And they believe in marriage, right? They even have the kids to prove it. Tall, taller, tallest. So the, what I want to talk about tonight is just a very simple message, really. It's, uh, in, in, it's in a very simple book called Song of Solomon. Okay, guys are like freaking out. Song of Solomon. <laughs> Song of Solomon. Maybe I should do a series on this book. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> so let's look at Song of Solomon. Do you have your Bibles with you tonight? Song of Solomon. And Song of Solomon is like the ultimate like love book. How many of you ever read Song of Solomon and you were like nervous about it when you were reading it? You found those three verses you're reading and you're going, oh my. You read those verses again and again and you, and you just like, you don't even want anyone seeing you reading them. So you're like, what are you reading? Oh, Revelation. <laughs> well, it looks like you're in the middle of the Bible. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, that's just a mistake. Um, but I remember my friend came to me, and I was, I was, uh, I was struggling with, with keeping my focus on what I should be keeping my focus on. And he said, I want to read you a text. And here's the text. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and verse 7. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles. I don't even know what that means. All right, daughters, here are some gazelles. I'm charging you. It's like, a, it's like a master card with gazelles. I don't know. But I'm charging you, O daughters, by the gazelles and by the does of the field. Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And I was like, why did you read me that? He said, because I wanted to read you this. Turn to chapter 3 and verse 5. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles, this sounds familiar, by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. I was like, why do you keep reading that? He says, it's the same thing. He goes, that's because I wanted to read chapter 8, verse 4 to you. I charge you, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles. He goes, no, the gazelles are not there anymore. <laughs> They're gone. But it's the same thing. Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And then my friend said to me, this is the word of God. Let us pray. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, like friends like that, who needs enemies, right? And I'm like, he goes, are you applying this to me? He goes, why would I ever say that? And you know, that was the best advice someone could give me, those verses. Let's think about it just for a minute. There's something called what? Love. And is it a good thing? It's a great thing. It's a great thing. I can tell you that unequivocally. Married. Four living creatures now before the throne. And it's a great blessing. But this is such good advice. I charge you. I adjure. I'm like really being seriously saying. I charge you. And all the witnesses are there, the does and the gazelles. Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. So don't stir it up, first of all. How do you stir stuff up? How do you stir stuff up? How do you stir stuff up? Where does it start? In your mind. Starts in your mind. How does it get stirred up in your mind? Start thinking about it. And then, what's the next stage? You talk to other people about it. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know, sometimes the more you focus on something, the worse it gets. The Bible says in one verse, it says, I would that you be naive concerning that which is evil. Did you know that it's actually evil to stir up love at the wrong time? How many of you know that's evil? It's actually very dangerous. It's kind of like starting a fire because love is called the most vehement flame. It'd be like going out on the trails and saying, you know, <laughs> I love fire. I think I might just start a little fire right here how many think that would not be cool? Not cool. So some things, you just don't stir up. Now, there are times to stir it up, because that's what it says. Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. There is a time that it pleases. Pleases who? Pleases who? First of all, God. It's not you. It's God. How many of you follow me on this? And I'm telling you, if you do not follow this counsel, you're going to have all kinds of problems real quick. So how do you know when it's time to stir it up? I remember once... My brother and I got in the car, and we decided we were going to drive the car. And so we did. But being seven years old and four years old, <laughs> things did not work out well for us. We drove down the driveway right into the mailbox. And that was a blessing, because if we had gone beyond the mailbox, we might have hit something else. So what, what needed to happen before we drove, <laughs> we drove the car? What? Yeah, we had to get a little older. We had to take some instruction. We had to, I mean, my dad had a very serious talk with me. <laughs> I can still remember it. We're very glad that you're 
interested in vehicles. <laughs> Very glad that you're interested in driving. But this is not the time. And taking your brother as a co-pilot <laughs> on your death wish drive was not good. No, I'm sorry, Dad. I'm crying. And I didn't have the emotional ability to stand up to anything at that point. And I still remember, you know, later on, he said, now is the time I could take driver's training. How many of you have ever been to a driver's training? How many have stories to tell me? I mean, they try to do all kinds of things to us in driver's training, like we're going down the street, and they say, turn left, it's a one-way street. I say, you're trying to kill us. That's what the teacher actually did. And she goes, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was a one-way street. I said, I'm going to tell your boss unless you get us ice cream. <laughs> anyway, that was, that was terrible. She got us ice cream every day. So anyway... But there was this, there was instruction. I remember, I remember another time, this, uh, there was another one of my people in my driver's training. Why do you remember this stuff? Because it's at that time when you remember everything. I can't remember what I ate yesterday, but I can remember what happened when I was 15. No, I can remember what I ate yesterday. It was good. <laughs> oh, wait, so do not stir up or awaken until it pleases. Don't drive until you have the permit, right? So I'm in, this, I'm in this car, I'm with these people, and they're driving this. We were teaching this girl hand over hand steering. How many of you have done hand over hand? Hand over hand. And you just let it slide through your hands as you're going around the corner. How many of you know how to do this? Well, she had the hand over hand really good. But then she got nervous. We're coming to a corner. And she did not let go of the wheel. So we're still turning. We went right through someone's bushes. We went right up to the front door. And she still was gripping the wheel. We put on the brakes, and there was a huge furrow in the, in the lawn. And the guy said, I don't think you're ready to drive. There had to be some maturing that went on. Now, my dad also had another conversation with me. It was almost like he had a microphone. Don, <laughs> driving a car is very expensive. It costs this much in our insurance to drive the car just with two of us. But now that you're driving, it will go up this much. We can't pay for that, and so you will. I was like, what? I don't want to drive. Forget it. Because I didn't have any money. But he says, I have found someone where you can work. I'm working. I'm, I'm lifting bags of cement. I'm like building stuff. I got home. This was by design. My dad was an evilly brilliant. No, he was brilliantly, anyway. He was, <laughs> I didn't say my dad was evil. I didn't just say that. <laughs> We're all learning. So anyway, he was very brilliant because when I got home, after working all day, what did I do? <laughs> I went to sleep. But finally, I made enough money to afford the insurance so I could drive. Now, was this, was, how many think this was smart of my dad? How many think this was smart? What was he trying to get me to learn? You don't do things until you can pay the bill for the things you're doing. How many of you guys think you could pay, how many of you young men here tonight think you could pay to support a wife? Please stand up. <laughs> All right. Ladies, this is not looking good for you. <laughs> you know all those guys you thought might be, yeah, i got to get to know them. No, they have nothing for you. They're kind of like me when I ran away from home when I was 16. I ran away about four times. <laughs> and this was one of them. And I ran away. I took my suitcase, and I took my pillow. And I took some stuff with me. I was very upset. And I ran away, and I realized I have no money. So I slept in the field underneath a tree. 
and went back home the next day. <laughs> this is what these guys are like, girls. Look at them. You're going to end up in a field under a tree. You're going to have to come back home. How many think this makes sense? What I'm saying doesn't make sense. So don't stir stuff up and don't awaken it if you can't support it. How many of you are just breathing a sigh of relief at this moment? Because you realize, oh man, I don't have to plan a wedding just yet. <laughs> How many of you are thankful for this? How many ninth graders out there saying, man, I'm so happy? <laughs> hey, look. <laughs> I don't know who's laughing out there, but maybe they should be crying. So um, do not stir up nor even awaken love until it what? Until it pleases. What a relief. But how many people don't listen to that? How many people don't listen to that? Again, there's the right time to do it, right, Fido? I've heard Fido's story. I know how this happened. I've heard the whole story. Would you like to hear the story? It's a great story. I've heard, I've heard Dean's story. It's a great story. I don't know if I've heard the other stories out here, but I'd love to. In fact, when I invite people over, I go, so how did you meet? Tell us about that first date. They start laughing. <laughs> and I just hear all the stories. By the way, my story with my wife is a true story. It was really a nightmare at first. <laughs> but there's a right time. When I met my wife, after, at, at, I, you know, I was ready. I had, I had a job. How many know what a job is? <laughs> I had a job. I was working as a nurse. I had the ability to pay for my school and her school, which I did. And it was the right time. In fact, my grandfather told me, he said under the tree, he goes, Don, you have a job. You have money. And she's a very nice girl. I would love to see a marriage before I die. <laughs> now, when something like that happens, and like he's a minister of the gospel, he's like 89. It's like probably maybe the last thing he's ever going to say. I would like to see a wedding before I die. That's big. It didn't happen. He died before we got married, but you start getting these indicators from people of maturity. Now, it's not like someone in your dorm. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. I mean, you might talk to them, but remember, they're gonna, you're going to end up in a field under a tree. You're not, you understand what I'm saying? It's got to be someone of maturity. Right, Jeff? Pastor Jeff? Pastor Jeff has a great story as well. I don't know. So I don't want to belabor this more. I could. I could tell you many stories. I could illustrate these things in many ways. But there are many stories in Scripture where not following this counsel this leads to disasters. I mean, I think Proverbs 6 and 7 is a great chapter, a couple chapters that if you want to lead, read a story of disaster. I think Ezekiel 16 is a great story of disaster. There's all kinds of stories that if you don't follow that counsel, it's a disaster. And there's all kinds of stories that if you do follow the counsel, there's nothing better There's great love stories in the Bible where people waited. Sometimes they had to wait an additional seven years after they were manipulated. I know when I was dating my ex fiance, my wife, her father did not like me. It took me five years to win his approval. 
Five years. Five. Look at the person next to you and say, give me five. Five years. And you know what he said to me during that? I remember one time, remember one time I went in and I was like, I told him, I said, I was, he was there and this is before he kicked me out of the house. I could never come back, he told me. Before that happened, you want to hear the story, don't you? Come to a marriage and family class next semester. Be right on the front row. So I'm sitting there and he begins to pray. And he's in this room and he goes, Oh, Lord, protect us from the attacks that come from without the family. And I'm like, whoa. I wonder, what's, I wonder who's attacking. So I unwisely opened my eyes during the prayer. You should never do this. I opened my eyes and he's looking right at me. And he says, oh, God, protect us from the attacks that even have come within. <laughs> Close my eyes. And I remember when it kind of turned around, I remember once he was praying again. And he said to me after the prayer, he said, Don, I pray every day, every day, that you will not marry my daughter. <laughs> I said, you mean every day? He goes, I've never missed a day. <laughs> and I said, you mean every single day? He goes, multiple times during the day. I find myself going on my knees saying, no, Lord, please. <laughs> he says that. And he said it with a straight face. He's looking at me with that stare of someone who has escaped communist dictatorship. He's like looking at me like. I said, this is terrible. Now, I said something at that time I should not have said. Would you like to know what I said? I'm not proud of this, but I'll tell you because it did change things. I said to him, sir, <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway because I'm, I'm building up to something. I said, sir, I, I just have to share. Do you mind if I share? He said, sure. He didn't mean it, but I did. And I said, I'm praying every day too, every day. Every day you're kneeling down, I'm probably kneeling down. Every day you're calling out, I'm crying out. So we're both praying. What's God supposed to do? I said, I think there's a problem. Well, you know what the problem is? He goes, what? Now, this is a turning point. That's what I'm telling you. I said, you're praying, and you're a little bit shorter than I am. And I'm praying, I'm a little bit taller than you are, which means... My prayers are getting there first. <laughs> now, how many think I should not have said that? How many think I should not have said that? Right after I said that, right after I said that, I thought to myself, I should not have said that. And then guess what happened? Right after I said that, he went, <laughs> And then he started laughing. <laughs> he laughed, like kind of a Romanian laugh. And then he, he pulled himself together like, <laughs> and he went back to the normal frozen chosen look. <laughs> but when he laughed, I knew, I, knew, I knew something had changed. <laughs> because when you laugh with someone, you cannot kill them. <laughs> you can't kill them. You cannot kill them. And you know, later that day, he came to me, he says, because he was like embarrassed that he had laughed. I mean, it was hard for him to have laughed at the enemy who he had been praying against. He came to me years later, and he said to me, he says, look, Don, because I had forgotten that. I had forgotten that, um, that incident. But he came to me, he goes, you know why, you know why it is that I put you through so many problems? I said, no, I really would love to know that because it was very hard. <laughs> it would have been nice to know back then. And he says, my daughters are more important to me than anything in the world. I escaped from communism for my daughters. I don't want to marry some fool I want them to value my daughters. 
How many think that was a wise thing? And just remember that. The person that's sent here to school didn't come here to get awakening love and all these things that before God, it pleases God. That's not the reason they came here. That's not the reason their parents sent them here. That's not the reason you came here. Right? You're getting ready. You're learning how to drive the car. You're learning how to tend the vineyard. In Song of Solomon, it talks about tending the vineyard, getting everything ready. Everything you're doing is getting ready for more relationships, eternal relationships. Some of the friends you make here, you'll have your entire life. Maybe people you marry, maybe people that you're just friends with your whole life. But there's a lot more plants in the vineyard. There's a lot of other work to do in the vineyard, maybe at this time. So focus on it. Do a good job in the vineyard. God will bless it. So what was the text again? Do not stir up. Say it with me. Do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. And once it does please, keep stirring it up. That's another sermon. Because some people have a problem with that. They don't stay in love. But that's another time. How many of you are just relieved that you don't have to be spending all that energy? How many of you are relieved? All right. Don't raise your hand because then I'd have to visit with you like, well, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of love, the gift of marriage, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Help us to have such a close relationship with you that you can connect with us fully. We connect with you fully. You can direct us. You can protect us. And uh, keep us focused on what you want us to be focused on. And we thank you. We come in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we have a special announcement, or do we?